This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. A week into the Calgary Flames first round, and it turns out that we were the ones that got roasted, not roasting the Ducks. After a four-game series, the Flames are four and out. And as always, I'm Dan Stevenson with Matt DeBorg. Matt, any overall thoughts on this series? Well, that did not go as expected, that's for sure. And honestly, I thought that this series was a lot better than it was two years ago. I didn't feel that Calgary was outmatched by Anaheim at any point in any of the games. It's just a lot of bad luck, bad bounces, bad goaltending, and bad results. I think that this is one of those series where we're going to look back and say, and we're already saying it, but the results on the scoreboard did not equal the results on the ice. This should not have been a four-game series. The Flames played great. The Flames were in it, I think, every game. There were times for I'd say a majority of all four games where the Flames were in control. The Flames were the ones that were dictating the pace. And I don't think there's a game I can look back at and say the Flames should not or could not have won it. Yeah, and... It was a one-goal series. Yeah, and I think that this series was just a, a team that is very experienced and has been there many, many times versus a team that whose core is a bunch of kids that has not gone through this battle multiple times and it experience one out like whenever calgary would get a bad bounce against them the team just collapsed in on itself you remember last week before we started this series i said to you i think it's going to depend if this is a street fight or a hockey game and in the end i think that's ultimately what this came down to the way i saw it is Every game, the Ducks played their game. The Ducks played their chippy, their physical, their, you know, some people have called it dirty hockey, and the Flames tried to play their game. And where the Flames ended up losing every game, I think, at least the first three, was when we started retaliating and getting upset with them and taking our eye off of our game. And then we started giving them power plays, and they take over the game. Yeah. Well, not so much game three because the Anaheim didn't have a power play that game. But No, but even then, you saw us trying to be tough guys and not yeah, just playing hockey. Enough. Yeah, I think we can, and we'll talk about individual games, but why don't we get into that? Let's start right from the beginning. Game one, we open the series in Anaheim. We have to deal with the dreaded curse of the Honda Center. And this right was... Right off the bat, the uh, dumb play where Anaheim looked like they should have got too many men on the ice penalty. Hamilton gets a little out of position because he was expecting a call, ends up taking a penalty 52 seconds into the game, one nothing Anaheim. And then, you know, Monaghan fired back on that one um, about halfway through the period. Bennett fired back. It's like, hey, we've got a 2-1 lead, and then the Flames end up having the Ricard Raquel and Jacob Silverberg goals early in or late in the second that sort of sealed our fate, and we were never able yeah. to score in the third. That turnover that led to the 3 on 0 for the Raquel goal, that was emblematic of the Honda Center. And for whatever reason, Calgary always in that building does something really stupid. Are you talking about the the bad line change on the Raquel goal? Yeah, and there's always something in each of those games in the Honda Center over the last 11 years where just one stupid decision in the game or one fluky bounce, whatever it is, and, like, the team just falls apart, like, oh, we can't win here, and... Then Anaheim struck a couple minutes after that, and the Flames didn't have any gas to come back. The way I look at this, there was three Anaheim goals and three big Calgary mistakes. Both of the power play goals were because of dumb penalties. Yep. The Getzlaff Getzlaff goal at the beginning, we took a dumb penalty. We gave them a man advantage, and they did what they were supposed to. They took advantage of it. 
The Silverberg goal, again, dumb penalty. They took advantage of it. The Raquel goal wasn't a power play, but it was a stupid line change. So this is one of those games I wasn't surprised to see them play that way in game one. I thought, okay, they're, like you said earlier, young team. They got the jitters. This is a team. They beat themselves. Yeah, they, they beat themselves. They made dumb mistakes, but I was hoping they'd sit down and say, okay, how do we fix these mistakes come game two? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> some interesting stats in this game, though. 37% faceoff wins for the Flames to 63% Ducks. I mean, you can't win a game if you can't win the draws. No. 14 penalty minutes to, for the Flames versus 10 for the Ducks, as we've seen all year generally. When the Flames take more penalties, they lose. But the Flames out hit the Ducks 33 to 30, which, again, wasn't really the stat we were expecting there, but the Flames were trying to match a lot of what the Ducks were doing. Yeah. And. I know that a lot of people think that faceoffs are overblown, and they're not really. It in a lot of situations over the course of a season, it doesn't really matter that much. However, when you get into the playoffs, if you're always surrendering the puck to the other team, it makes life just that little bit harder and. That can be the difference between a a goal or a chance going against you when that didn't need to happen. And especially when you're basically losing two thirds of the draws, it's hard to overcome that. And each time you're in a situation like that, it just makes life that much more difficult. And when a series can change on a single bounce, you don't want to be giving the other team more ammunition. I think, you know, sometimes I would agree that face-offs, sometimes people say they're overblown, and I think maybe neutral zone face-offs are. But to me, you can't win if you don't have the puck. You can't shoot on the other net if you don't have the puck. So if you can win the face-off, especially in the offensive zone, you get that first couple seconds to decide what you want to do to get off a good blue line shot or something like that. And if you're losing draws in your own end, well, you're giving up free shots on your net a lot of times. So you've got to win those face-offs if nothing else to dictate the pace of the game. Yeah, and that's one of the things that the Flames are going to have to make adjustments over. Uh, and, you know, credit Anaheim, they were the best face-off team in the league this year. So, like, that doesn't help matters for Calgary, but... Well, and those stats will get a lot better as we go through the round, too. Yeah, and... Like, uh, Backlund and Monaghan were fairly close. Backlund won slightly more than 50%, and Monaghan was at 47. Those aren't too bad, but, like, everybody else was a disaster. So I think we can kind of, at least when I look at this, I kind of write this off as a learning experience. The Flames are, like you said, a young team. They're trying to figure out how to do this playoff thing they're trying to feel out the ducks to me this was that learning experience that they needed yep and hopefully we're going to make adjustments and go into game two i say this as though we don't already know what's going to happen here but take a day off come back in the honda center again and once again we get a three to two ducks win this time the flames fared better in a lot of the stats categories we had 41 percent of faceoffs compared to the ducks 59 uh, 17 penalty minutes, the Ducks 15, so not that much more. We got out hit 38 to 34, and we had 21 blocks to the Ducks 12, but we only gave up 11 giveaways to the Ducks 21. So better in some categories, not as great in others, but still not a great game here. Yeah, and this game, it was Brian Elliott giving up two incredibly soft goals in the first six and a half minutes. And it put the team behind the eight ball entirely. And it's hard to rally when, especially the Raquel goal, that was really a terrible goal from behind the net. Like, he wasn't even paying attention to where the puck was. And, like, the puck was already in the net before he even realized that Raquel was even there. And, you know, so. the, there's some things I saw here, and we did see Anaheim come out in this one and try to play hockey. You know, and play uh, not people hate it when I say that, but to me, Anaheim a lot of times is more playing the body than the puck. And in this game, I thought we saw some really good hockey, and there's some good things they did that really made the Flames suffer because of it. And if we want to become an elite team, we got to do the same things. 
One of the things I noticed here is the Ducks were very good at making us skate when we shouldn't have had to skate. Every time we had a power play, what did they do? They took the puck and they flipped it all the way down the ice. And they were yep. good at making us waste that time, making us waste those chances. Like you and I talked about earlier, it's about possession. And we might have possessed it, but we weren't going anywhere with the puck once we possessed it. So, you know, they were good at, at wasting that time and making us get tired. Yeah, and like credit to the Flames, they did battle back in this game and tied it in the second period. And then just like the first game, a ridiculously dumb penalty late in the third period gives Anaheim a free chance and there's the game. And it, yeah, it was a weird goal where Getzlaff tried to pass it across and it hit Boma from like 50 feet out <laughs> and fluttered into the net but you can't have penalties like either hamilton's or brody's in a playoff game period well and, and especially... just a lack of discipline and overall hockey sense like you just can't do those things especially and against the... a team like the ducks no who every time and... you go on the power play they have the ability to make you pay for it yeah it's not like you're playing vancouver where oh gee i took a penalty big deal we can kill this off no big deal you know they do have a good team and you just can't do that and again that's inexperience uh, like dougie hamilton's penalty in the first game that led to the first goal and the penalty in the second game that led to the game winner those were just inexperience and that's part of the frustrating thing with this team is that they're very young most of their players that are the key players in the team and they're going to make mistakes and hopefully they learn from it like Hamilton in games three and four was significantly better than he was in the first two games but that's it's an education and unfortunately it being a four game series it would have been better if there was just more games to give them more of an opportunity to learn some lessons, but yeah, it, it's a team that is a team that is not used to playoff hockey playing against a team that lives for playoff hockey. I mean, if the ducks didn't make the playoffs, you know, someone would lose their job. Oh, easily. Or if they even lo say they lost in five games to Calgary, honestly, I think the general manager and possibly the coach would have got fired. Like this is almost a team that looks at the at the regular season as an eighty two game preseason. All they care about is the sixteen wins they need to get the cup. Yeah. And they're in contender mode. Their best players, Getzlaff and Perry, they're the key guys for a team that's trying to win the Stanley Cup. And they're I think thirty one or thirty two right now. So like they're they're not far away from having to enter rebuild mode themselves so like this is one of their last shots at winning the cup so they have to be good a couple more notes on this game i thought um it's worth noting that this is michael backland's first uh postseason goal the one that he got shorthanded in this game uh no it wasn't uh he had the game winner in game three against oh Anaheim sorry my bad his first shorthanded uh postseason goal so uh um, yeah, it's, you know, and good to see him contributing that, you know, I thought one of the, the things that we didn't see enough of this postseason was the 3M line. I thought they weren't as dominant as they have been. It's tough when you're playing the same team four times in a row, but it was nice to see that from Backland. Um, yeah. Also, the Monaghan goal here, I had to kind of laugh because we, we know that the Goudreau slashing on the hands thing has been an issue all season. And in this case, Goudreau got slashed in the hands. They went away, and it was just sort of Monaghan getting vengeance for that finally. You know, because Goudreau got slashed in the hands, we got the PP, and we took advantage of it. So I had to kind of laugh at that. It's like, you know what, it serves them right for trying the same old trick. I thought that in the third, we got quite a few good chances, but the Flames just lost their discipline. They took over in the second period. I thought this was definitely the Flames' second period. And credit to uh, the goalie, John Gibson, for, I think, keeping them out in that second period. But after the two soft goals against Elliott, it was going to be hard to recover from that. And it was really... The game was sunk after the first period, I think. Yeah. 
after that second game, the Flames returned to the Sea of Red, and it was an electric Sea of Red. Even if you just watched the game on TV, you know, you could see more red than we usually see there. And played in the Dome, and this is one where I was really, really hoping the Flames would be able to pull something out at home. We know that we struggle in the Honda Center, but we don't always struggle against the Ducks here. And once again, we had a, a game that the Flames should have won, could have won, and didn't win. And this, to me, is the most disappointing game in the series. What about you? Oh, easily. And this was just... They should have won that game. And it just such a lack of discipline. And again, terrible goaltending allowed Anaheim to recover and win this game i mean like, by there mid- is absolutely no way the flame should have lost this game but, after going up 4-1 well that's it midway in the second period we're up four to one my old hockey coach when i played hockey you say one goal you got nothing two goals you got insurance three goals you've probably won that game and it's tough to see a four to one lead slip away and become a five four final score so to me this was the heartbreaking series or a game of this series I thought that first goal from Monaghan was really nice. I was glad to see that Brower got the assist on it. Um, you know, Brower was supposed to be our playoff warrior, and I thought, okay, maybe he's coming alive here with this uh, playoff assist. Didn't really happen. Um, the second well, goal... I have to argue with that. He did quite an effective job screening the goaltender throughout the series on the power play, and I think that... But for what I'm paying the guy, what... anybody can do that. Yeah. If I'm the GM, I'd be saying, you know what, I'm not sure this guy's worth, you know, $4 million plus just to be able to screen that goalie. That's a lot of money. Oh, I know. But he was contributing is what I'm saying. Like, he was contributing, but, I'd, but I don't think like he necessarily pulled his weight. The goals that the Flames scored on the power play were caused in part because of his excellent screens. So, you know, it... Yeah, like ideally he'd be playing better, but at least during the four games in the series, he was one of the Flames' top three players, in my opinion. I would, I wouldn't say one of the top three, but yeah, I think we saw him contribute more than we have all year. At uh, top four, I would actually put Monahan, Versteeg, and Bennett ahead of him, and then Brower. Well, let's talk about Versteeg. Versteeg got the second goal of this game, and I thought, you know what, that's what you need if you're going to score against the Ducks. We had lots of traffic in front of the net, and Versteeg was able to just pop that one home, and, you know, that's what you've got to do to score on, on these goalies is both both goalies that are playing for the Ducks is you've just got to, you know, pound have lots of traffic in front and pound it in. Uh, the third goal of the game was the Michael Stone goal, the third Flames goal, that is. And Michael Stone got that nice goal from the from the point. Um, not a guy who we've seen a lot of point shooting or point scoring from since he's been here, but it's nice to see that he's got that kind of, show, that kind of shot. Oh, yeah. And I think that if the Flames re-sign him, he'll be a good number four moving forward. I, I think if you look at this game, the Flames ended up dictating the pace, at least at the first you know period and a half, maybe two periods. The Flames were really the ones that made the Ducks play our game and adapt to our game. And it was just, I don't know what it was. Uh, you're right, it was just the goaltending that late in the game, we just couldn't... I'd say even in the third, actually, we were probably having the Ducks still play our game. They just were able to get more pucks past our guy than we could get past Bernier. Yeah, and like the late goal in the second period, if the Flames weren't distracted by Corey Perry at the Flames bench and were actually paying attention that, hey, the game is still going on, then I don't think that Theodore gets the chance that he did. And realistically, that is a puck that Elliot should have had 100 times out of 100, but it is what it is. The Nate Thompson goal in the third period, I've seen multiple angles of it, and I still, for the life of me, do not understand how they ruled that a a legal goal. You're talking about the Nate Thompson high stick here. Yeah, I still don't understand that, because there was the one angle that showed where it hit on the stick, and, like, if you just draw a line, like, it was his where it hit on his stick was pretty much in line with his nose on his face so 
I don't understand how that counted, but well, and, it is and not what only, it is. not only the fact it counted, but I think the fact that now we're gonna have some Flames fans who think the league is out to get us, you know, after '04 and this, and I'm already and hearing the Bennett thing a lot two years ago. Yeah, I'm already and, hearing from people that the league's out to get the Flames. They'll never win the cup. There's some sort of conspiracy, and I don't know what you meant. I'm not. I'm just not buying it. No, it was a bad call, and I think it was a bad call by the ref to call it a goal, but. That's a break that goes against you. But not only now, the ref, and, 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 it was also no, reviewed. I know. It was a missed call on several steps, in my opinion. But a good team goes, okay, we still got the lead. There's only eight minutes and 46 seconds left in the game. That's it. That point is 4-3 Calgary. Yeah, we got this. But instead, the Flames collapsed in on themselves, allowed Theodore to score his second of the game, and then Corey Perry getting the winner in overtime, which was a bad bounce. And they just collapsed. And like, oh, we got another thing like the in the game one where the bad line change. Okay, yeah, it happened. Oh, well. You know, it it was a mistake. Who cares? It's a tie game. We got half the game left. We got this. But instead, the Flames collapsed. Same thing here. A bad call. You know, it's debatable. And, but in this case, we had the lead. And instead, the Flames c- collapsed in on themselves and just gave up. And that's one of the things that this team moving forward will need to learn is that crap happens and bad calls happen weird fluky goals happen there's nothing you can do about that but you can control how you actually play and respond from bad calls or missed opportunities and instead like in each of the games really they collapsed in on themselves and didn't give themselves a proper chance to actually win the game i think the biggest thing here like you said is we're ahead at this point it's not like in anaheim where you know maybe you're behind or you're tied depending on which of the fluky goals in edmonton or in anaheim we were ahead this was our game to lose at this point and we lost it and that like you said that theodore goal should not have happened neither theodore goal i think should have been let in you know and by by the time we got to overtime i think our confidence was so shot I was sitting watching this game and I said, we're going to lose this. Like, you know, just looking oh, at the way we were the, playing as it. As soon as they called the or the Thompson goal a goal, I even said to the person I was watching the game with that the Flames are going to lose this game, guaranteed. Because they collapsed in game one, they collapsed in game two. Anything that goes against them, they just pack it in, call it a day, and... Sure enough, a couple minutes later, the tie game, and yeah, well, if this goes to overtime, it's going to be a Ducks win, and it took a minute and a half. So no surprise in that one. I mean, surprise going into it, but, you know, and if you look in the playoffs, when you make a team play their backup, you're going to win it 90% of the time. Oh, easily. Like, we like forced... If you're, yeah, because usually the goalies done something wrong <laughs> yeah like we forced them to change goalies and at that point i was sitting watching and the person i was watching with i turned to them and said we got this you know we've just forced their hand we made them change goaltenders they're upset it's our game and it should have been we were up four to one at one point and you know when you lose a game like that that's where you've really got to reflect as a team and say what's going on yeah so the that leads us into the fourth game the last one here in calgary on wednesday night and again, we all know how this one turned out. It was a two to one Ducks win, or sorry, three to one Ducks win with the empty netter. Um, Calgary got more shots on goal, thirty-seven to twenty-five. Calgary outplayed the Ducks in the faceoff circle, winning fifty-eight percent of the draws. The Ducks forty-two. The Flames were one for three on the power play. We had less penalty minutes for once, and far more hits, twenty-eight to fifteen, and. Going into this game, I mean, just looking at the way the Flames played, you could kind of tell that they knew they were done. Oh, yeah. I don't think either team... They beat themselves in the first three games, so it's... 
hard to come back from that. Like when you've literally given away three game, the first three games of a series where arguably you're the better team in each of the games, it it's hard to. You're more waiting for okay, what's the bad thing that's going to happen now? And it took five minutes and thirty eight seconds for the bad thing to happen. The Patrick Eves goal, another soft goal that it should have been able to save. Like as a starting goaltender or a playoff team, those aren't the kind of goals you should be letting in. I actually, I'm going to go further. An NHL goaltender should not have let that in. What if you were an Oilers logo? Even then. I'd expect more. Ooh, them be fighting words, man. Not yeah. even good enough to be well, on the oil. Honestly, Elliot played himself out of a contract with Calgary in these four games. Like you just, you simply can't have a goaltender like that in your organization. Well, let's let's get to that after we're done with this game. That'll be yeah. our next topic. But um, I thought in this first period, it felt like it should have been seven nothing Ducks. Like I just thought the Ducks came on hard. You could tell they were ready to end this series, and. It just seemed like they took the right after that Eves goal, the they just took the gas right out of the Flames game. Yep. And I thought they scored another one right after a minute and a bit later and I thought it just the, Yeah. The, I thought coming well, into the second the Flames started to fire back though. I thought they played a pretty complete twenty minutes. Yeah, I do I agree with you there. But and then they finally did get a goal. They got the goal, they worked hard for that Monaghan goal, but then again, late in the period, they started taking some penalties. They took, you know, two penalties late, I think, which you can't be doing. No. And, and especially against this Ducks team. they We know from three other games, they will make us pay when we sit in the box. Yeah. And all the credit in the world to Gibson for having a bounce back game in game four. Honestly, with the Flames' chances that they had, the Flames should have probably won this game if not for him. I was honestly surprised Gibson started. I thought, you know what? They got this in the bag. They're going to reward Bernier. Yeah. Well, they're probably wanting to make sure that Gibson is... You know, like if he had another bad game, it, then it's 3-1 Anaheim going back to the Honda Center. So who cares? Yeah, you know, like then you just put uh, Bernier in for game five and... You just run with Bernier until you're in the next round or you're done. So, you know. I... And of note as well, Brian Elliott, probably the earliest I've seen a goalie ever get pulled, faced three shots, gave up one of the three, and immediately got pulled for Chad Johnson. And I thought that of the two goalies, Johnson, my, Johnson, I was thinking, well, why didn't we do this earlier? Like, he looked composed, he looked ready to go, and I think he made this game so that it was not much higher of a score. He, I wouldn't say he stood on his head, but he just looked like the better of the two goalies. Yeah, and you got to remember that the Flames don't have either of these goalies under contract for next season. And they were wanting to see, especially with Elliott, is this guy a player that you keep? And... Uh, that's why I firmly believe that they gave him game four because after game two and three where he pretty much lost the game to the the Flames in each of those games that, okay, we're giving you one last chance to redeem yourself and see if you can earn a contract with us and you give up a goal like that in the first five minutes, yeah, that's enough of you. It's pretty much take your pads off, never come back. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. You're done for the game. Go clean out your stall. Pretty much, yeah. A yeah. um, couple other guys they were trying out here, for those that didn't realize it. Boma and Stajan sat out this game, and instead Curtis Lazar and Freddie Hamilton drew into the lineup, which, you know, it's really a fourth-line change. It didn't mean a whole lot in the end, but I thought that Lazar, as we've seen every game he played, he played 7 minutes, 16 seconds. He had a good 17 minutes, 16 seconds. Yeah, I agree. Freddie Hamilton played They were 640. noticeable in a positive way. Yeah, I mean, they they didn't save the game, but they're not going to save the game. I mean, you know, the day that Freddie Hamilton saves us a series, you know, something's wrong something's with the rest of this. Something's gone a little weird, yeah. Although so, Nate Thompson for the Ducks did end up doing a lot to end the Flame season. So, you know, it can happen. It's just unusual when it does. 
I want to give the Ducks credit in this one for late in the third. The Flames had their goalie out of the net for an extended period. They were getting a lot of good shots on there. I was, I don't want to say convinced, but I was pretty sure the Flames were going to end up tying this one up on a few of those shots. And good for the Ducks to shut the Flames down and keep pucks out, of, to keep that puck out of their net. You know, you were starting to see the Ducks, I thought, let up about that point. You know, we, we saw the timeout. We saw the Ducks start to sort of let up. They knew they had this one in the bag, and then the Flames fired back with a bit of offense. And it was like, yeah, okay, this is silly. This is enough here. And eventually they ended up getting the empty net goal. Yep. So, and, you know, it's not, not all doom and gloom. Like, yeah, the Flames largely beat themselves in this series. But you know what? But, for young players, this was a good learning experience. And a guy like a Chuck, we saw him hold his own. You know, guys like Furland still held his own against BX. So, like, this is what we need for a young team. We just need them to get in there and play and say, now you guys know what to expect next year. Yeah, and you got to figure that Anaheim at the end of the season was one of, if not the hottest team coming into the postseason. And honestly, if you changed the numbers and said that the Flames won all four games, I would not have been shocked based on how the games were played. And it wasn't like two years ago when they faced the Ducks where the Ducks were just manhandling the Flames in all five games. And the Flames were lucky to win one of those games on a last second comeback. But like, Anaheim was in complete control of that series. In this one, honestly, I thought Calgary was the better team for the vast majority of it. It was just a lot of bad bounces, bad goaltending, some bad calls, and just well, bad luck. Well, I think, yeah, I think in the end, and let's get into this. In the end, I think this was a series that was caused, that co was cost us by our goaltender. He cost us the series. And. You know, the Flames came into this season new goaltending. We got rid of Hiller, we got rid of Ramo, we got rid of Ordeo, we cleaned house on the, you know, on the in the net. We we got rid of everyone that had played for the Flames last year. We brought in two new goaltenders. We traded for Brian Elliott. We brought in Chad Johnson as a free agent. You and I looked at it at the beginning of the year and said, "You know what? This might be the tandem we need." And in the end, Elliott didn't perform. I think well, it, and to credit both Elliott and Johnson, they did a good enough job that they got a team that finished with the fifth worst record last year to the postseason this year. That's so, true. We would you know, we would not have got to the postseason without Elliott. I got to give him that credit. Yeah, but when you actually get to the postseason, you need your goaltender to be able to stop a puck, and unfortunately, that was not the case. So, Matt, I think we're both going to answer yes to this question. Have we seen the last of Moose in a Flames jersey? Yes. For sure. Guaranteed. 100%. I would be amazed if he was back. If for no other reason than if we re-sign him, we owe St. Louis a third-round pick, I don't think it's worth it. No. Even if it was a fifth-round pick or so, anything, really. Yeah, I just uh, – move on. Like so, it, Just like with Ramo and Hiller – it you tried it didn't work nice try you got some postseason experience move on get new goaltending in so what about uh the other guy chad johnson do you bring him back honestly no i i think johnson played enough good enough to earn a backup role but i think you just have to you got to make a statement you got to kind of wipe the slate clean and start again and it'd be one thing like if the flames didn't have a guy that was ready for the nhl then sure bring Johnson back as the stop gap backup but Gillies has played well enough in Stockton well enough in the one game that he did play that you're going to need to make room for players to actually get an opportunity in the NHL and especially with Tyler Parsons being ready for the AHL next year he Gillies has to go somewhere and uh, it in terms of development for him and for Parsons, you need to make a spot available, and Gillies has to play in the NHL next season because you can't just keep everybody in Stockton forever. Like you need to actually promote, see what they've got. If they're good enough, you keep them. If they're not, you go on to the next guy. And this, this is honestly, we haven't been 
good at doing as an organization. You know, if you look as long as I can remember, I mean, it's always been UFA goalies, UFA goalies, UFA goalies. Who's the last guy that we promoted that did anything? Probably McElhenney, as bad as that is. Like, he's still in the NHL. Well, but like Kidder? Like, who was the last guy who had any impact? Was it Trevor Kidd that we promoted? Yeah, and it, before that, Vernon. Like it's you know two we have yeah like last, we had like two guys in the Moss, last thirty years. All yeah. sorts of these you know throwaway goalies. Yeah, two guys in the last thirty years. And it's not something we've been good at. And I don't want to say that Gillies is the next Kippersoft, mm-hmm. the next Vernon. Um, no, but you have to see, and you can't figure out what Gillies is or what Parsons is. Unless you actually give them a shot. And that's part of the problem that the Flames have had. Especially even not just in net, but with guys like having Stajan and Boma in there. You're not allowing guys like, say, Jankowski or Shillington or Anderson or Lazar to get a shot. When they're showing well enough where, like, you have to give them an actual chance in the NHL to see what you have. Like, you, and I think you that's where I think that's where that line between rebuild and playoff starts to get blurred, too. You know, if we were a rebuilding team, if there's no way we were going to make the playoffs, you'd say, yeah, you know, maybe we bring – maybe we would have had Gillies up this year. And I think that's where you've – as a GM, it's hard to sometimes walk that line between, okay, do I give the young kid a chance or do I try to win now? And I think that's, like, Calgary has gotten to the point where they're a good enough team that they will get to the postseason even if they have kids that are having a hard time in the depth roles. I think we have enough veterans that the kids don't have to be looked at as those, you know, big roles. We've got our top six established. We've got enough vets in the bottom six that, yeah, you can bring one or two kids in, and if they flounder, someone will pick up the pieces. Say, like, next year, say the Flames sign Stone and you have your top four of Geo, Hamilton, Brody, and Stone. Why not have Shillington and Anderson as your 5-6? You're going to save money, one, which is a big one, <laughs> especially if you're going to try and get a, a legitimate first-line right winger. See, I don't like rookies with goaltender. rookies on the blue line. I want I know, there to be... I know, I'd bring... I understand that, but... It, if at the deadline like those guys are floundering like it, then you can go out and get like a veteran guy like a Johnny Oduya or whatever but if you're not giving guys opportunities like you could even put say Stone with Shillington and Anderson with Brody for you know to not have guys isolated but if the Flames aren't giving the rookies a shot then we won't know what we have and especially when you've got guys like hickey that he's ready for the stockton after this season upcoming like you're we're gonna need to see what the guys that are currently there have and if you're not giving them a shot then we're kind of stuck. I have no problem with Oliver Shillington and Rasmus Anderson both being called up. But again, I would also bring in an Odu year, some veteran and assume it's going to be one kid in the vet on the third pairing and either rotate them out or play till you, you know, don't look good or something like that. But I just, I don't like the idea of both of the kids together as a third pair. I know. It's just that the flames need to, we've been great. We've been great at on the, on the forward side. I mean, look at our top six. They're all, Guys we promoted, you know, you got Monahan, you've got Goudreau, you've got uh, Kachuk, you've got Bennett, you've got Furland, you've got all these guys that were sort of drafted by us and homegrown, if you will. But yeah, the blue line and the net especially. I mean, the last big net prospect we had was Ordeo, who I think got overripe and we got rid of him. Before that was Irving, and where's Leland Irving these days? We've got to bring Gillies up. Yeah, and that... Especially with the cap itself, like we're starting to get into that phase where, like, we're going to be a cap team and we're going to need to have guys on entry level deals playing. Thankfully, Calgary has enough of a prospect base where you can have like four or five guys throughout your lineup that are on the entry level deals, like Jankowski, the defenseman, Gillies. 
so that way you can go out and spend money on a top line right winger. Well, and even look at the Ducks. I think four of their six defensemen are on entry level contracts. Yeah, and like that, you just have to look at Anaheim and. Like, there's no real difference between, say, Brandon Montour or Shillington or Theodore and Anderson. Like, there's marginal differences, but they're all basically the same caliber of prospect. So, uh, did Anaheim suffer by having those guys in the lineup? No. So, like, yeah, if, say, Shillington and Anderson have struggles throughout the year, well... A, they're learning at the NHL level, which that's helpful. And B, if necessary, you can go out and get somebody at the deadline. But, like, I don't see spending, like, say, $4 million or $3 million on a third-pairing defenseman just because we're scared of playing some kids. Like, the, the Flames' core of their team is mostly young players, and for Calgary to take those next steps into being a cup contender, they're going to need to have more youth in their lineup. So let's get back to the goaltending for a second. So I think we can both agree. Let's, let's pen Gillies in as a backup. I don't think Gillies is good enough yet to win a starter job for a playoff ready team. Would you agree? No, uh, 30 games for him, 50 for the starter. I think is fair. So now we got to find ourselves a starting goaltender, Matt. So I think this year, the most likely way they'll go just because I don't want to give up a lot. I don't think we have a lot of asset to give up right now is UFA. That's entirely feasible. It also depends because of the expansion draft, like under normal circumstances, that's true. You wouldn't be able to pick up some of the backups that might be available but because of the expansion draft, teams might be sort of like getting Michael Stone for a third round pick. Like I, under normal circumstances, that wouldn't have been the case. But well, let let's talk about some of these goalies that are out there. Let's look at the UFA class this year first. Um, I think, and you you and I were kind of on the same wavelength here. The most likely UFA targets would be Scott Darling, Jonathan Bernier, Ryan Miller, Ben Bishop, Steve Mason. If you want to bring back Elliot or Johnson and Jonas Enroth, right away I'm going to take Ben Bishop off the list. I don't want to pay what Bishop's going to get as a UFA this year. No. I think he's, he's by I far the best in the class. And honestly, I think he's the most overrated, and I don't think that he's – I think he's on a downward trend in his career. Yeah, but he's going I, to get like an 8 for 8 deal. I honestly, yeah, I wouldn't pay more than $5 million for Bishop. Oh, I wouldn't either, but I think somebody's going to overpay. Somebody who thinks that, you know, he can solve their problems now. Now, if, say, like, three years at, say, 16 and a half or $17 million, sure, fine. You know, like I wouldn't it, even I'd go be, that high. I, I That would be the upper limit. So Five and a half to six, that so, would be, like, my upper cap on him. So looking at the rest of the list, I'm going to take Ryan Miller off. I don't think that an aging goalie like that is right for where we are. I think no, if, if, if we had Gillies one year away or two years away, if this was the next, you know, Matt Murray type of backup, maybe you say, okay, get, you know, Miller's a good enough stopgap. But right now I don't think Miller is the guy. No, me either. So that leaves us with Darlene, Bernier, Mason, and Enroth. Um, I, I would like to see Enroth here. And if the flames aren't confident in Gillies, I think Enroth would make a good backup. Yeah. But I don't uh, think Enroth I, is a starter. I don't think that Bernier Mason or Enroth are good enough to be a starter. I like, if you're going with Gillies as the backup, I'm, I'm not confident enough in the abilities of those three guys to say, yeah, sure. Fine. The yeah. only guy on that list that, I could conceivably see is Scott Darling. I like Darling. I think I've said this before. I could see Darling here, and I think this could be the market he needs to break out and really show what he's got. I think he's been in that Corey Crawford, especially now in Chicago. He's in the shadow of Corey Crawford, and I think that he's the next backup who's poised to become, I don't want to say a great starter, but a good starter, a proven yeah, starter. Yeah, I could see him being Calgary's version of Cam Talbot. Yeah, that's, that's... A guy that was stuck between behind a good goaltender in Lundquist, in Talbot's case, didn't get an opportunity until he got 
put on another team and once he got there he flourished well and even I a think, Corey schneider fits that role too yeah and i think in the flames case a guy like darling would make a lot of sense i think bernier you could do and you could if we had a stronger defensive core i think you could probably get away with bernier for some teams but i don't think the flames are there yet no and i think like if that was the case you might as well just stick with elliot so if if the flames i i think the flames aren't confident in gillies you've got to move them and get an asset for him like if they just say you know what this guy's not nhl ready move them get an asset and then bring in a guy like mason or enroth and th- there's your pairing. I think a Darlene Mason, Darlene Enroth, or Darlene Gillies pairing, it's a good pairing. Yeah. I don't think it's going to win you a Stanley Cup, but I don't think anyone's expecting that next year, but I think it's a playoff caliber pairing. Yeah, and the Flames need to take those next steps towards, like, okay, yeah, we made the playoffs this year. Now we have to take those next steps where – it, it'll be us and Edmonton vying for the, the division title next year. And we need better goaltending throughout the season than what we had. And I don't see Darling as your, you know, long-term Kipper soft. I see him as a no. three, four year stopgap until we figure out who we've got in our own organization. I mean, if you look at most teams out there, that are still in the playoffs, they either have a homegrown goalie or a goalie they've really they acquired as a backup or a prospect and developed themselves. And we're not at that place yet. And I think we need to figure that out. But I think Darlene gives us a good enough chance yeah. to figure that out for three, four years. Yeah. And that's if we're going the UFA route. If we're going the trade route, then there are a lot more flexible options. Well, let's talk about that too. So as Matt mentioned earlier, we have the expansion draft coming. Teams can only protect one goaltender in the expansion draft, which means there's going to be somebody out there who's going to lose a pretty good goaltender for free. And if I'm a GM, I would rather move that goalie to Calgary and maybe get less than market value than lose him for free. Matt, yeah, do you want to do you want to go through the guys you looked at as trade bait? There are four teams that have veteran guys that they're more likely to move, and five teams that have very good starting goaltenders where the backups are available uh i'll start with the veteran guys first uh you have anti ranta who's also a bit of a veteran guy in his own right stuck behind lundquist in new york you have mike smith in arizona they've got a couple of decent goalie prospects that i think they'd rather keep instead of smith uh, just do his contract. Uh, Detroit, they have both Jimmy Howard and Peter Mrazek, and you could get one or the other. It depends on who they value as being their starter moving forward. And, of course, Pittsburgh with Marc-Andre Fleury, although in his case, I think financially for himself, I think he'd rather be bought out by the Penguins because he'd only have to make a million and a half each of the next two seasons to just break even on what he's getting paid and you'll get paid more than that as ufa in which case i'd target him as well just like with darling and then the five young guys you've got philip grubauer who's stuck behind Braden holtby in washington you've got calvin pickard who's behind varlamov in colorado Jonas corpusalo who's stuck behind bobrovsky in columbus uh, UC Soros, who's stuck behind Pekka Rinne in uh, Nashville, and Malcolm Subban, who's stuck behind uh, Tuka Rask in Boston. So, Matt, I'll give you my take on this, and I'm assuming that we're – I'm going to assume first we're looking for just a starter. Let's assume Gillies is the backup. I don't think Grubauer, Picard, Corpusallo, uh Soros are ready for stepping in right away. I think those are the kind of guys you need two, three years to really get up to what would be a consistent playoff level. I don't want to touch Mike Smith in that contract with you know a long stick. I want to stay as far away as we can. I think Howard is past his prime. I said this is the beginning of the year, and a lot of people chastised me for it. I still think as a stopgap starter, Mark andre Fleury is the best bet. Uh, I... If he, he, I'm assuming that he gets bought out by the Penguins, personally. So uh, just because it financially it doesn't make sense for him to accept. 
I don't know if they would uh, buy him out. I think that they would. I I think the Penguins would try their luck and try to swing a deal to either keep him and you know offer some future considerations or let him go to the. Uh, to well, the, that's the thing. The he Vegas has a no trade clause uh, in his contract, which means that he automatically has to be protected by the Penguins. That's true. Uh, in which case, they have to give Matt Murray away. Yeah. And, that's where, like, financially for him, it doesn't make much sense to play ball, to be exposed and get selected by Vegas because he knows that Vegas is not going to be very good. So, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's where, like, if I'm him, like, I'd rather pick my destination via yeah. being a UFA than doing any favors for Pittsburgh. Going into this season, I was I had said I thought that Andy Ranta would make a good flame. You probably remember me saying that. I yeah, said, you know what, the and flame. I agree. And and I think that if we can get him for fairly cheap from New York, I mean, there's no way they're going to put Lundqvist, um, no, you know, unprotected. So if we can get Ranta again, I don't think Ranta. I think Ranta and Bernier are sort of at the same level. They could be good, but they need a year or two with starter minutes to really see if they can be a starter or not. Yeah, and Ranta is young enough. He's only 27 right now. That eh, he'll be 28 next year. Conceivably, you could get away with him being the starter, playing 50 games. He played 30 this year with the Rangers. Posted a 226 goals against average, 922 save percentage. You could bump him up to 50 games. I yeah, I don't think that'd be too much of a lift for him. So, See, my my thought still though, if I have Rant as my starter, I want somebody more proven as a backup. I know. And... I would rather take a Johnson or a you know, I'd bring Johnson back or a Enroth or a Mason. I don't like the idea of a Ranta Gillies pairing. I know. And that's the thing. Like honestly, if I I'm gonna put on my true living hat here and i i'm gonna pick who i would go for oh i thought you're gonna make me some pizza with your true living hat on no sorry wrong wrong true living there if it's me and i have my selection and the costs are all roughly the same to acquire anybody i actually go with Jonas corpusalo of uh, columbus who's stuck behind bobrovsky i think that he's a larger goaltender if I recall correctly, he's only 22. I wouldn't I, be opposed to taking Corpusello, but then I need another guy, a Bernier or a Darling or somebody, I think, to fill the gap because I'm not sure Corpusello is going to win me 50 or 60 games next year. Yeah. You know, if it was me, I would take Corpusello. Tell him you got to win the starter job, but I'm going to bring in somebody like a, you know, a Mike Smith or a Bernier or somebody on a a one maybe two year deal, even a Ryan Miller for one year, and say you know we don't want Miller as a starter, earn it from him. But I just don't know the Corpusalo is where he needs to be to take this team to the playoffs again, and I'm not yeah. sure that as a backup Gillies is going to be much help either. No, and that's. Like, the Flames are in a bit of an interesting situation where they have a good guy in Gillies. And honestly, I don't see much of a difference in terms of talent between him or Grubauer or Picard or Corpusalo. I think they're all good backups. It's where you're getting into a philosophical situation. I think they're good backups who have potential to be starters. Yeah. And, like, if Calgary believes that like regardless of who their goaltending is that they're a playoff team and like especially if they go out and they get a first line right winger and you know a good number four whether it's stone or somebody else do if you believe that regardless of your goaltending that you're a playoff team philosophically do you say screw it we're just gonna go with and get a guy a younger player or a guy that might be a backup and say you and Gillies figure it out. You dictate who plays the majority of the games next year. Play till you lose. And like, if you're say Grubauer or Corpusalo or Ranta, 
one of you, either you or Gillies is getting 50 games, the other guy is getting 30, you figure it out. Do you just say, you you know, we got you, you're in our organization now? I Go think play. with, but with where the Flames are, I think that's dangerous. It is. But do you take a risk at getting, finding a Kiprasov? And are you that's willing? Where are, the flame, that's where the Flames are right now. Is they need a Kiprasov level see, goaltender or a Vernon or somebody. But see, the, the thing we're missing there is with Kiprasov, we had Turek. We had that seasoned vet. He wasn't necessarily the best, but we knew. Okay, I mean, Kiprasov remember was brought in to be a backup. He wasn't being told, "Hey, kid, we're bringing you in to shoulder the whole load." He earned that role. Yeah, but the flames also were in a different spot there where like For the sure. team itself was not very good. And we're one of the few teams that's figured everything out and not the goaltending. Usually if you look at a rebuild, they sort of figure out the goaltending yeah. first. Like we have three lines right now that are good enough. And like, especially if they get, go out and get a first line right winger, like the top nine is set. The fourth line, you can either keep staging in Boma or get some of the kids in either way it'll be good enough the top four good enough so like it, it you know it, like there's no real weakness in the, the top end of the lineup whereas like in 04 it was basically a Ginla Regeer and a bunch of misfits <laughs> basically and Kipper coming out of nowhere like uh, the Flames weren't expected to be a playoff team that year and like now it's a weird situation where like we need a goaltender that's an elite goaltender and we don't have anybody that stepped into those shoes so do you just take a risk having gillies and another kid from one of these teams and just throw them in there and say hey we got a good enough team with everybody else that we should be in the playoffs regardless have fun it, you know, it's you're in Gillies, fight it out. Whoever is the better guy gets the spot. Just like Anderson and Gilly, uh, and Gibson and Anaheim. But I'm more confident ago. doing that with an Anaheim team than I am with Calgary's current team. Yeah, true enough. But I think Calgary's gotten to the point where they're good enough. Where Are you willing to sacrifice a playoff year for that? Sure. I am. Because the Flames need to take the next step and be a contending team and if they don't have a good goaltender it you just look at this season they had a good enough team to make the playoffs bad goaltending cost them the playoffs looking and, at this list sorry go ahead yeah I, I think that they've gotten enough from the other 18 players where like unless the the goaltenders become so abysmally bad where it's like uh you guys aren't even ECHL caliber they should make the playoffs like as long as the two goalies are NHL caliber they don't have to be good the flames will make the postseason cuz i don't think that gilly or uh, elliot or johnson played well enough this year to consider them above average goaltenders they were just average this year so as long as whomever th the two goalies are as long as they're average the flames should be a playoff team it's just figuring out and testing and seeing like who will emerge as being those elite who is the starter who is the backup and i think if we already got one guy in the tank with gillies who should realistically play about 30 games why not try another guy who has experience of that 30 game level and see like so it, of those guys then ranta and darling are the two that i would be most comfortable with so would i but they're also the oldest guys Nah, yeah, but but I they're mean, they're both twenty. Uh, Ranta's twenty seven, twenty eight. Darling's twenty eight. But yeah. you know, that's when goalies start to peak. I mean, these aren't yeah. these aren't forwards where you're nineteen, twenty, and playing no. in the league. No, and I agree. When was the last time we saw a twenty year old playing sixty games? True. So like uh, that, I wouldn't. You know, if Ranta and Gillies or Darling and Gillies is the tandem next year, sure, fine, awesome. It's just one if, of these things that if we're going to go with the younger starter, I feel we need the veteran backup. I'm not 
I know what you're saying, but I'm just not comfortable with a Corpusalo Gillies. You guys figure it out. I would be much more comfortable me looking at this list, going with something like a Darlene Ranta or Darlene Corpusalo, and say, you know what, you guys have one year to figure out who it is. We're gonna flip one of you at the deadline and bring Gillies up. Possible. You know, I just feel that the Flames, they're a little too conservative in how they view the lineup. And it's sort of like two years ago when the Flames just said in training camp, here, we've got all these spots available. Whoever wins it, wins it. And the Flames ended up making the postseason as a surprise because guys overperformed because they were given a shot. Last year, they were kept the more entrenched lineup. It constricted everything. They missed the playoffs this year. Yeah, I don't know. They, they've I, got I, some holdovers. Like, I think that they need to... They've got a good enough core of their team where I think they're a playoff team regardless now. So I think they can take a few more risks in their lineup to give guys shots and just say, here, a ball is here, take it and run with it. Yeah, And I, I, they might I fail, but... I think that in order for the Flames to take that next step from being playoff team to taking that step to being contending team, they have to take some risks. So then, Matt, of this whole list, Darlene Bernier, Miller Bishop, Mason Enroth, Grubauer, Picard, Corpusello, Ranta Smith, Howard Mrazek, Saros, Flurry, and Subban. You're the GM. You've got your true living hat on still. You've got Gillies in the backup. Who do you pick to start? Or somebody off the list? Uh, honestly, I'm going to say it's a coin flip between Grubauer and Corpusalo. Uh, with Scott Darling as, like, if the cost is too much and you can just sign him and he'll come here, those would be my three. If the cost is relatively cheap, like, say, like a second round pick for either Corpusalo or Grubauer. We don't have a second. We gave it up for Moose. 2018 second, or like a guy like Shin Carrick. Or, you know what I mean? Like a second round pick valued. Pl- I, I know where asset. you're going with this. I am going to go with either Darling or Ranta. I think that you. And need... I, can, I can agree with that. They're they're still in their they're still in their twenties. It's not like we're bringing in a Ryan Miller or you know a Mark Andre Fleury or nearing the end of the career. I think both of these guys are just starting to peak. I think both of them are at the point where you start giving them more games and they're either going to sink or swim. And both guys I think are going to be guys in this league who are going to swim. And I want one of them to swim with a with a C on his chest. Yeah, and like even a guy like Grubauer, he's only 25 so it's not like he's a young kid where Corpus Allo is a kid like he's the same I, I think though Gillies. Grubauer we see this all the time he's been propped up by a great starter yeah I know and it's one of those situations are you getting a Cam Talbot you know what I mean yeah uh, that's <sighs> to me I just I haven't seen enough of Grubauer's work. And I think it's like a flurry scenario where are they being propped up by a great team in front of them? And you, you got to be careful because they had to bring them in go, okay, we don't have as great a team and they fall short. And that's why I'd rather bring in a Darlene or a Ranta where we've seen a bit more of their body of work with different rosters in front of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I know what you mean. It's one of those that, and I think, just, honestly, I think it largely depends on acquisition costs. Like say like, Washington or Columbus asks for the 17th overall pick for either Grubauer or Corpus Allo. You say, thanks for the interest. See you later. And, you know, we'll find something somewhere else. I also think that Scott Darling is going to be pretty cheap. I think that there's going to be a lot of GMs who are going to just be. Well, there's go- not a lot of starters. I, I think everybody's really. going to be going full bore for Ben Bishop for the two or three starter spots available. Yeah, I think like there's that, just not a lot of starter spots open. And you no, look at a team like Calgary, we are kind of built like Chicago was and is. I think so, everybody's going to chase Bishop. I think those that aren't and are looking for a more seasoned backup are going to chase Bernier. Yeah, like uh, there's only a couple of starter legitimate starter spots available. And like if 
honestly, as a team, Calgary is the best of the teams that, like, you look at Vancouver, like, oh, oh gee, I'm going to go start for a team that's probably going to finish 30th next year. Like, no. Like, financially, that's, you're just being stupid. So, like, uh, you know, Calgary is an attractive option. It's just that you might be able to get somebody good. Like, uh, it just depends it on the acquisition costs. Like, well, let's let's assume Matt that we've got the goaltending figured out. It's going to be one of Grubauer, Corpusella, Ranta, Darling. Yeah, we've got Gillies on the back. Now we've got to move out from the net. We've got a whole bunch of guys this year who are UFAs, and I think more interesting this year is our free agent class. There's a lot of guys who've been around the organization for a little bit that we have to make a decision on. So let's go through these guys fairly quickly. I think we'll be uh, pretty much on the same page on most of them and just say who we'd re-sign or not. Does that work for you? Sure. Um, we've got Curtis Lazar. Easy, yes. He's an RFA. I'd bring him back. I think that Lazar has a promising future here, and I don't think you give up what we gave up to Ottawa to get him, just to let him go. No. And um, realistically, a million bucks, give or take a couple hundred thousand, should do it. Chris Versteeg. Yeah. Uh, two years at two and a half, I think, is as much as I'd go with Versteeg. I wouldn't be surprised if you see this one done after July 1st just because of the expansion draft and he's a UFA and then you don't have to protect him and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, I yeah, I, I think Versteeg, there's no reason not to bring him back here. Yeah. He'd make a perfectly viable third-line player. You can stick him on the power play. Awesome. No Brandon problem. Bolig. Gone. Um, the other guy that came in the Lazar deal was Mike Koska, who's also UFA. Gone. Just he—he he was only a toss in for contract, I think. So I think that it, the team was deciding between him or Bar Bartkowski to be the AHL vet, and I think the Bartkowski is going to win. Mm -hmm. Um, Dennis Weidman. Gone. Derek England. Gone. I think England leaves. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of England's, but I think. And people still don't think I'm right. I think you see him in Vegas. He's a Vegas boy. He's going to be the Vegas hometown star. Yeah, and honestly, I, with how he played towards the end of the season, I think he's getting a little long in the tooth. And I, with him being 35, I don't want him back. Well, and I just I look at his contract, and I think that we that money can be used better elsewhere, including maybe a net. Exactly. Um, and I think the next guy on the list who could easily replace him with the play style is Mike Stone. Yeah, and easily re-sign him. I think we'll both agree that Stone should come back. I think we'll both agree Johnson and Elliott are done. Yeah, sure. Gone. Next, next one on the list is your boy, Garnet Hathaway. Should be in the NHL starting game one. I think that the I think Hathaway gets signed, and I think that his making the roster really depends on Boma being moved out. I think honestly, he's a cheaper Boma. Uh, yeah, honestly, I see Boma getting bought out. Well, we'll talk about that, but I yeah. think Hathaway and Boma, I think Hathaway is the poor, the cheaper Boma. Yeah. And I don't think Hathaway can make the team till Boma's gone. Yeah, and I think that's why buyout time, but that will get there. Michael anyway. Furland, who's a UFA, or an RFA, sorry. Yeah, the easy re-sign. Alex Chason. If he's cheap enough, sure. Like, uh, uh, what was his contract last year? Uh, See, to me, I think Chase on his losses. Eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand. If you get him for say nine hundred thousand or a million bucks, fine. But Matt, well, you've been talking about bringing the young guys in. To me, Chase on has lost his job to Lazar. I think Lazar is a better version of what Chase. I think Lazar is a better version of what Chase on should be. And I'd rather get rid of Chase on and bring a guy up from the farm. Chase on, I'd keep it. It depends largely on the expansion draft. If Las Vegas takes Brower, Chase on gets retained. Okay. And you know what I mean? And if uh, Brower is a flame, then I'd kind of let Chase on go. Yeah, if Chazon comes back, I'd do a one-year. I think this is a very transitional player for this team. Yeah, I agree. 
Uh, Sam Bennett, this is going to be the big contract to watch, is what kind of money Bennett can squeeze out of the Flames. Honestly, I would say a two-year, like, two-and-a-half would make sense. Yeah, I mean, if you look around the team, and I think it's great that he's on this team right now with comparables. So, I mean, you know, looking at comparables on the team, Lance Boma is making 2.2. Bad deal for Boma. I think well, that'd be about well, good I'm, money. I'm hearkening back to like Backlund's contracts and like yeah. his second contract. Backlund's was making three point five right now. Yeah, like Backlund was in the two two and a half range, like after his first entry level deal. So, you know, I think you're going to see one of these things where the Flames will be pushing for two, uh, Bennett's people will be pushing for three. I think we'll probably settle two point five and do a bridge deal. Yeah. Two, two and a half, give or take. And that's reasonable. We're still figuring out what we got in back in Bennett. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, like he only had twenty six points this year. Give him a bridge deal, two years, see how he does. If he performs well enough where he's a five million dollar player two years from now, awesome. If not, then you look at either keeping him at the similar rate or moving him out. And I think there's still gonna be value there in two years. Yep. The next list is a bunch of guys, many of them have been around the organization for a while, but these are all the Stockton Heat names. So, uh, Brett Kulak, guy we saw have a couple... Fine as a number seven. See, and I'm going to disagree there. I think if you bring up Shillington and Anderson, you need to bring a veteran up there to complete the seven. Yeah. Yeah, if... Yeah. Like uh, if you're not gonna bring one of Sh- if you're gonna bring one of one of Shillington and Anderson, not the other up, maybe bring Kulak up. But I'm not comfortable doing a Giordano. Um, I'm not comfortable having the defense of just Giordano, Hamilton, Brody, Stone, wide or um, Anderson and Shillington. You need to put another vet in there, and Kulak's not that guy. I think I think he'll be in the NHL. I just think that he's he just doesn't fit right now with Calgary. And honestly, I would sign him and have him basically take Watherspoon's spot. As sort of the veteran call-up guy? Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I think he'll clear waivers. Yeah, so do I, because every team has a Kulak. And that's it. Every team needs one. I was going to say he's very expendable, but yeah, I think that's... And if somebody wants him, or if he plays his way onto the team, that's awesome. Like, there's no... Like, if he gets put on waivers, I would be shocked if he was claimed. And, like, if he's playing well enough where he's going to get claimed, then he won't be put on waivers and you'll just send Shillington or Anderson down. And I, think, and I think that also gives us your opinion on the next guy, Tyler Watherspoon. Goodbye. See you later. I think Watherspoon's going to be an interesting case. I could see Vegas picking this guy up for AHL depth. Yeah. Oh, uh, he, he will play in the AHL next year. But I think he's I just, one of those guys a young team like Vegas might say he's good enough to play 10, 20 games. Let's throw him in the A until we need him. Yeah. Um, Lyndon Bay. Thank you for having a good year in Stockton. If you want to play in Stockton next year, sure. Otherwise, see you later. I think I'd bring Bay back just because he gives us that AHL veteran depth. Yeah. David Riddich, the goaltender. AHL backup. Looked reasonably well. Not sure what we got there still. If uh, Parsons makes the leap into the AHL next year, then having him splitting time with Riddich like Gillies did, see how each of them responds. We don't have enough of a playbook on Riddich to see whether or not he's an a- NHL goaltender yet. Another I hate it season. when you have two blue chip goalies splitting time in the A. I think Riddich is probably going to be a career AHL guy. I see him a lot like a... I don't know. We've there's a number of those guys out there that have sort of been AHLs. They come up as a backup once in a while, and they go back down. Um, you know, Mar- a Jan Denis sort of guy, and yeah, yeah, I just I can see that. Like he'd fill in in a pinch in the NHL. I just don't. And I can see a weak team saying, you know what, he's good enough. Let's bring him up as a backup for a season, that sort of thing. But yeah, I just I, I think just Riddich... haven't seen enough of him. Like, okay, he had a great year in Stockton. Repeat the way I look that. at it, though, is what, who else are you going to bring in, in that role? Like, Riddich is a good AHL backup. Resign the man. Give him another year. It's not like we're looking around going, we have to have this guy instead. No, and honestly, I'd rather have Mason McDonald being in the ECHL, 
playing yeah. most of the games. Mason needs he needs another to year play, in the... Yeah, he needs to play through his struggles. And he, he's still a good prospect, Mac, Mason McDonald. He had a bad year. I think I'd bring but, Riddich in for one more year and then see what we've got with McDonald. And if the team says, you know what, this guy's AHL backup material, then great. But Riddich is a good stopover for one year. Agree wholeheartedly. Um, the next guy is a guy you were high on when the Flames signed him, and that is Kenny Morrison. Looked good. Played in his great first for the run. first bit and then vanished and has not been the same player since. This is, see this you is later. the Bryce Van Brabrandt of the blue line. Yep, gone. Culkin and is the next one on the list, and he's gone. You've always said that him and Kulak were the same guy, so pick, yeah. the, pick the one that works better and get rid of the other one. Yep, I agree. And, and Culkin, unfortunately, a lot of injury troubles. He still could make the NHL. You know, I think Culkin, with just with his injury troubles, I think this is a guy who's destined for an ECHL career, and that's where you see a lot of these guys who – you know, just run into injury problems. They're good enough to play, but no one wants to give them the contract, especially with the 50 contract limits now. Yeah, I could see Or that. you see him play in a league overseas. Like, I think he's good enough to play pro hockey. I just don't know if he's good enough to play on an NHL contract. Yep. And last one, and I think we'll both agree, yes, is John Gillies. Obviously. I, I'm penciling him already as the backup next year, so... So, overall, keeping most of these guys, everyone on the pro team stays except for Weidman and England, um, which, you know, I think Weidman is a, yeah. is a given, and the goalies. Um, overall, I, I think I'd be happy with that. And there's not – it's not like we're getting rid of someone like a hoodler who it's like, hey, who are we going to bring in instead? It still gives us some flexibility to go shopping, but it's really just if I look at it, minor holes that need to be filled. Yeah, like realistically, this team – needs a first line winger if you bring Versteeg back that fills that spot in the third line fairly adequately and a number four defenseman which we already got in Michael Stone so bring him back or a comparable guy Stone's and a guy a where I don't think he's necessarily a number four on a Stanley Cup team but I think he can be a number four on a playoff team yeah I agree but uh, by then you'd hope that one of Anderson or Shillington or Hickey or Fox well, that's it. will so I think, emerge I, as that number four. Exactly, and that's why I think Stone is a good – I think just like a Versteeg, I think these are good stopover guys. Yeah, and that's why like I want to see gap. the third pairing or, or like the number five, number six guy being Anderson and Shillington to see – if one of them will emerge as that good number four, and you can't really tell until you actually give them a shot. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And in order for a lot of those guys, I mean, the defense is where we're going to have the most holes to bring up young guys, but there's some names like, and you've talked about some of them, Jankowski, um, Hathaway, guys who the Flames might want to look at on for, on the forward side, and we don't have a lot of spots. So, Matt, you posed this question, and we also got this from a fan of ours. Uh, Steve Doherty asked this. Should the Flames buy out Stajan and Boma? To do so, Stajan would cost $1.8 million next season and 666 the year after, saving $1.3 million a year. You compared this to, you think Jankowski would be who they'd bring up if they did? Yeah, well, it would make sense because Jankowski was one of the elite players in the AHL this year. He needs time in the NHL. He's a good face-off guy. Fourth line, makes sense. And the other guy is Lance Boma. Boma would cost a six sixty seven or point six six seven million next year and seven sixty seven the year after that we'd save one point five million. Hathaway is going to be cheap. I mean, what's the league minimum these days? Five hundred fifty thousand. Well, even if it's say seven hundred thousand, like six seven hundred thousand, who cares? Like it's uh, gonna be saving almost a million dollars. So, Matt, if you do, you still have your true living hat on. Yes. Okay, your true living. You've got your hat on. You're not making us pizza, but you're making flames decisions. Uh, Stajan, do you buy him out? If Stajan and Bo this is under the assumption that. Troy Brower gets claimed in the expansion draft. So we don't do this until after Hunter the awards. Carrick. Yeah, or Hunter okay. Carrick, one of the two. And Stajan and Boma are still on the team because there is a chance that uh, Matt Stajan does get selected by Vegas. So if Stajan and Boma are on the team post-expansion draft, both of them 
bought out. What if only one of them's around? What if staging gets taken? Do you buy a Boma? Buy out the other. Okay. So you just think these guys are done? Do whatever it takes to get rid of them. For me, honestly, we need to get younger. And which doesn't make a lot of sense because we're not really an old team. But we need to get rid of players that are just okay. And Stajan and Boma are okay. They're NHL players. They're fine. You throw them on your fourth line, awesome. They'll do a good job. But the Flames cannot be content with just being a playoff team. They need to take those next steps. And Calgary won't do that if they're stuck with too many okay players. You can be fine if you got Troy Brower as being your okay player on the wing. But too many okay players in the lineup, it, you need players that can do unexpected things. And I don't see Stajan or Bulma doing anything unexpected. stajan has been here for long enough. We would know if he was going to do something unexpected. Yeah. And they're good. NHL players. Fine. Awesome. They will get jobs elsewhere. But we have guys like Jankowski, Shinkara, Klimchuk, Manjapani, Hathaway that are... Poirier. Yeah, that are on the verge of needing... Well, they uh, they need spots in the NHL. And the top nine is more or less fixed right now. And, uh, you know, like especially if the Flames go out and get a first-line right winger, then you've got a good second line with Kachuk, Bennett, and Furland. Well, I think if we get a, a top-line winger, it's Chase on that suffers. Yeah. Then you've got Versteeg uh, with Backland and Froelich as the third line so you then, break up the 3m line yeah i think uh, in order for kachuk to move forward and bennett to move forward they need to be given more of an opportunity together and i think a second line of kachuk bennett and furland would maximize that so then you're left with the fourth line of boma stajan and brower and okay well that's great but Where's room for Hathaway, Jankowski, any of these other guys? You need to make room, and if you can't trade them, you need to buy them out. And they only have one year left on the deal. Yeah, it sucks for the year after that we'd be on the hook for like $1.4 million of unnecessary cap hit, but we'd be replacing them with guys on entry-level deals, so it's not that big of a deal. Remember, we're already paying out Mason Raymond next year. Yeah, so... And are, are we on the hook for, uh, what's his name, Grossman? How does that work? I have no idea. So, I, I understand where you're coming from on this. I've never liked buying guys out. I mean, I think it's the last resort, and I don't think we're the last resort on these guys yet. We'll talk about it later. I've been saying all season, and you've heard me say it a number of times, everyone that listens to this show, I think there's a good chance Matt Stajan gets taken by Vegas, either in the draft or in a trade. I oh, think yeah. There's... Like, ideally, you find somebody to take both of these guys, even if you have to take a contract back that you can stick in Stockton. But even then, I think that if I can get rid of Stajan, i just make Bowman my 13th forward. I think I'd bring up... Hathaway, despite that, bring up Jankowski, and Boma essentially takes Lazar or uh, Lazar or H- Freddie Hamilton's job. Yeah, I just the, don't. I don't see well, that, the GM see, wanting to buy out both of them yeah, at once. Well, that's the problem is that like we've got too many guys that are in the NHL or NHL ready, and we've got just too many bodies. So somebody's got to go. See, and... if it was me, I wouldn't bring Chase on back. I'd put Lazar in his spot. I would. Keep Boma around because I think Boma's a serviceable crash and bang guy as long as his skates aren't too close to the net to put pucks in on our own net. Um, and, you know, as a 13th forward, he's veteran enough that I think he can stay in shape. Freddie Hamilton, I think, has a job here as long as Dougie's here. So, you know, maybe he's an extra forward as well. But I just, I think it's going to be easier to move Stajan to Vegas than it's going to be to find a buyer for Boma. I think if, if Boma, if we were going to find a buyer for Boma, it would have been the deadline. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, but I'm hoping that two of the three or all three of Brower, Stajan, and Boma are off of this team in the offseason, one way or another. So, 
Because I'd like to see some kids come in and dollars being reallocated towards, like, a legitimate first-line winger for Gaudreau and Monaghan. Because that's the only way that the Flames are going to take that next step is if they have a legitimate first-line winger. And Furland, he did a great job, but you can't... Good enough is not we, good enough. We were lucky with what we got from Furland. Yeah, like, I... I that's why I'd like to see Kachuk with Bennett and Furland make them like the disturber line <laughs> next year. Because obviously Furland has enough skill where like he could play with Kachuk and Bennett and be f- perfectly fine well, with and that. I, and I so, think if Hathaway comes on the team, Furland has to be less of a disturber. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Like it, It's one of those things that like the Flames they only need a couple of things to make their team really good. And unfortunately they've got so much money tied up in guys that are just in the way. And if they can get rid of some of those guys that are just in the way, either via trade buyout or the expansion draft, that would help to clear some of the log jam in the organization. And we'll talk more about what we might see coming into the organization as we get closer to free agency. Yeah. Um, but we've talked about the goaltending, we've talked about the blue line, we've talked about the forwards. There's two other big names. A guy who, since the beginning of the season, when we lost terribly at Edmonton, fans have been calling for his head, Glenn Gullitson. Um, to me, I, I keep him around. I like where we're, where Gully's going with the team. I see no reason to get rid of him. But again, there's fans calling for his head. What do you think, Matt? Uh, there's He got the Flames back into the playoffs. I like his system. The Flames were just hamstrung with a quarter of their cap tied in players that could have been replaced by farm players this year. And, like, any team who has $18 million tied up in AHL talent, it's hard to compete. When you've got five and a quarter tied up in Weidman, Troy Brower could have been replaced internally, Stajan and Boma could have been replaced internally, England could have been replaced internally. And not really see any difference in the overall play of those players. It's hard. So like it, if but Gullison, the, like you said, he got us to the playoffs. That was his job. Yeah, his so, job wasn't to come in here and guess Lord Stanley's mug. His job was to get us to the postseason. Yeah. So like once you remove the eighteen million dollars and allocate it to players that actually are deserving of those funds, and like are actually worth like being like a seven million dollar player then the team can have more of a overall complete lineup to it and be a contending team giving Gullitson a proper team to try and win the cup with and Gullitson's boss whose hat you've had on all show Brad Treliving our general manager his contract is over July 1st and I've heard some people discussing both ways. Should we bring Tree back? Should we not bring Tree back? And the first thing I ask when somebody says that is, and who do you replace him with? Right now, I think that Tree Living, I mean, he's done some fantastic stuff for us. If you look at Dougie Hamilton, you look at, you know, Anderson, uh, Shillington, I'd say that Tree Living's done a lot more good than bad. And I see no reason not to bring him back. It's not as though there's a GM I'd rather have who's going to be available. To me, Tree's earned another contract. Well, the worst contracts that he's signed were Mason Raymond, which was understandable for where the team was at the time, because uh, we looked like we were going to be in a rebuild for a long time. And and, and Raymond made the was playoffs. the familiar guy, too. Yeah, and then it, last year with Troy Brower, which honestly I don't think is as bad of a contract as like a lot of people do. But uh, mainly because he got hurt ha- with a hand injury halfway through the season. And we even saw Goudreau not play as well before or after. So what do you do? Do you bring injury. Tree back? Oh, easily. And, you know, like if those are the only complaints that you have are, oh, a guy is slightly overpaid. And yet all of the trades were awesome. And all the acquisitions have been awesome other than a couple of overpaid guys. Like, if that's all you can complain about, you've got absolutely nothing to complain well, about. Well, and looking at some of the holes we talked about earlier, and if we're going to take 
this team and get those pieces we need. Get that goaltending tandem or single goalie, depending on how you look at it. We're going to get that that you know top right winger, whatever else we might need. I think the tree living is the guy who's going to get those done, and we're going to look and go, we paid what? Like. Yeah. How do it's like the Hamilton deal? Like I think if anyone's going to get this done, and if anyone might be able to get us, say a you know Mason um, or sorry a um, a Darling Ranta type pairing, it's going to be this guy. Yeah, or like, Corpusalo Darling. Or, yeah, or you look at um, like say the goaltending next year. Like honestly, I don't see like even with Gillies being the backup, like I don't see the Flames spending mo- much more than five million dollars on that, which is slightly more than the four point two that we spent this year. So, like on defense, if we go with the kids plus Stone, like we're not gonna, we're actually gonna be saving about six million dollars. So, like we're gonna have savings in certain parts of the lineup to be able to spend elsewhere either through trade or free agency so we're good and you know like the team will be good next year so it's just a matter of seeing exactly what shakes out of the tree and in order to see what shakes out of the tree we got to bring the man that they call tree back into the organization i don't think there's any reason to get rid of for living He's, he's the right GM for where we are, and I think we've stifled too many GMs by cutting them off for they've seen their plan through. And I, to me, Trees earned the right to see this plan through. Um, Matt, almost done really talking about Flames stuff. I don't think there's a lot of other Flames stuff out there. The only other one, as we talked about earlier, is the Flames are guaranteed to lose one player for nothing. Las Vegas gets to take somebody from our roster. It could be Stajan. It could be Boma. It could be Shin Carrick. We don't know who it's going to be. What are your, I guess, what do you want and what do you think is going to happen for the Flames in the expansion draft? Well, I think that unless England signs with them and that would be our player. Even if that happens, I think that that organization is smart enough to just do it July 1. Yeah. Uh, other than that, like, I could see them taking Brower because of the familiarity, because the GM there did spend a first round pick to get him into Washington previously. So, like, there is some familiarity there, and Brower's contract isn't overly egregious anyway. Like, he's about a million dollars overpaid having a bad year where he was hurt for a good portion of it. So, you know. I the only other guy would be Stajan uh, for like a professional player and beyond that it would be Shin Carrick so if you're if you're the Flames and you have this player that has to be taken I think that from a Flames perspective Brower or Stajan are the best case I think those are the guys they're kind of hoping you know what do us a favor and get this off our books what if you're the Flames, though? Would Could you see them making a deal? Here's here's an idea I had. Let's say the Flames are talking to George McPhee ahead of time. He doesn't sound like he wants to take Brower. What if you go to him and say, look, if you take Brower, we'll give you Boma for your troubles? If that's the case, like if you're going to toss something at him to take somebody, I'd actually go a little bit higher than that i'd say here's brett kulak or even shin carrick even i don't know i mean if you want to buy you know you're or talking about here, buying boma out or like uh we'll even give you a draft pick if you and boma yeah we're running out of draft picks this year yeah so what we got a good prospect pool. I, I guess yeah if you have to do that but if you get away and, and you know you, you i know you're gonna say whatever the cost is you know if it's a fair price but let's just say you could do it you could do a one for one you know we'll give you boma if you'll take brower i think that would be the ideal or we'll give you boma if you'll take stajan you know i think that would be the ideal for the flames getting rid of two of the three contracts they probably wish they didn't have right now and the, you might have to toss another thing in on top of that. Because sure. like, you're doing us a favor, so here, you know, we'll give you prospect B or whatever. You know. Yeah, I, I don't think you get three players moved like that. I think it's either prospect B or Boma. I would yeah. be 
I can't see us saying that we're, we're going to give you Boma and Kulak for future considerations, mm-hmm. which is really what it would show up as on the on the sheet. The one thing I can see the Flames doing, because we're smart enough to do it, is working a deal with L- with Vegas where maybe we give them um, Boma and they take a goalie that we want in the expansion draft, and then it's Boma for that goalie or Brower for that goalie. Yeah, and I could see that too. You know, we talked to them like ahead of time. Like here, you say, take, hey, sh- say you take Shin Carrick off of us in the expansion draft, and we'll trade you Brower for goalie that we like type of thing or yeah. something like that. Yeah, I could you definitely can figure out that. which way to deal with it. You know what I mean? So I, I still, I still believe that if we're just looking at the expansion draft as an isolated incident, I still believe Stajan's going to get taken. Yeah, I could see that. I think the Flames. I don't think that just from a pride thing. I don't think Tre Living is going to expose Brower. I, I think, think he is. I, we don't have any space to keep him. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think the staging gets when exposed. When we got and... Lazar, Lazar was the seventh guy up front. So that's true. Yeah, you're. You, that's true. You're not gonna. You're not gonna give up what we gave up for Lazar and then expose him. Yeah. So it's basically Lazar or Brower. So Could obviously be. Lazar gets kept. And of those two, I think staging is cheaper than Brower. So you'd probably take staging. Yeah. We'll see. It'll be interesting. We'll just have to wait until we get there and. It'll well, be an Matt, interesting couple days anyway. For sure. Well, Matt, I just want to remind everybody, it's that time of year again. Um, we always like to hear from our audience every year as we start looking ahead to our next year. We have our annual audience survey. And what the audience survey is, it takes about 10 minutes or 15 minutes of your time. We just ask you some questions. What do you like about the show? What was things you liked? What would you like to see change next year? Um, you know, Do you like it when Matt and I play a predictions game? Are you jealous? Do you wish you could play with us? What is it you want to see from the show? And we'll take all those under advisement. And we're currently putting together a prize pack of Flames and Fireside Chat stuff. So what we do is we draw one person who's filled out the survey and given us their info, and we'll send them that prize pack. We've done that two years in a row now. Um, I'll post on the site in a few weeks what that prize pack is going to be, but we're still working on that. So you don't need to give us your info if you don't want to, but if you do give us your name and email at the end, you'll be entered to win the prize pack. So you can get to that at www.firesidechat.ca slash survey. And that's where you can get to our audience survey. And that'll be in the show notes as well. Yeah. And our draft coverage this year is normally each year I do previews of most of the players in the top 70 or so in the draft is going to be scaled back just to roughly around where the flames are picking in the first round just due to the fact that the flames do not have a second or third round pick that's also not a very deep draft no it's a terrible draft like honestly dylan dubé and tyler parsons are better prospects than what we'll get at number 17 so like it that's why I wouldn't be opposed to trading number 17, but that's coming up on our draft preview show sometime in June. Is it even worth going over our playoff predictions? Nah, we sucked. So <laughs> we had <laughs> three games. Wrong. I thought that we'd win one of them. You thought we'd win two of them. Yeah. We didn't suck. Elliot sucked. Sure. Anyway. We'll run with that. <laughs> We weren't well, wrong. The goalie was. <laughs> we weren't the ones that let the puck in the net. We could have yeah. won this. We could have won both games if we would have kept the puck out of the net. Yeah. Oh, anyway, well, it um, happens. Thanks to everyone for joining us this season. Thanks to our friends at Tick Ticks for sponsoring us this year and helping to keep the show on the air. We will continue to do shows as there's news, as we always do. We're shutting it down now, probably for the rest of the playoffs. And check Facebook, check Twitter, check our website for when we're going to ramp back up generally we ramp back yeah. up about may and then you know go till the draft take a week off and then we do a couple free agent episodes and then we take the rest of the summer off yeah which we may only do one episode for the draft because usually we do like one episode for round one and like round two and beyond but because of the lack of draft picks this year we may just wrap that all into one show so just and, check firesidechat.ca, check us out on Facebook at yeah. fireside at facebook.com slash fireside chat or on Twitter at fireside podcast and we'll let you know exactly what we're gonna do there when we have a better idea. Yeah. And 
again, we'll have news like with the expansion draft and the draft itself and free agency. And... Well, that's all the same time. I mean, it's all like the same week. It's award show, expansion draft. It all comes right in June. Yep. And then we'll be doing the our usual the development camp and looking forward to next season when hopefully the Flames take those next steps into emerging as a contending team instead of just being happy with being in the playoffs. So Matt, now the Flames Road, who's your uh, who's your team for the rest of the playoffs? Well, the team that I expect to win hasn't changed, and that's the Pittsburgh Penguins. So I think they're the team to beat. Honestly, yeah, I I don't really care. Uh, Guy at yeah. work today said, with the Flames out, now you're cheering for the Oilers, right? I said, no, there's no boo, way to cheer for the Oilers. Boo, boo that man, boo. <laughs> I I cheer Boo. for the Sharks. I'm cheer for the Sharks just to beat the Oilers handedly. Yeah, they're the only team I hate in the playoffs. Then I'd hope like San Jose beats Anaheim just because you know they beat us. So yeah, there's two yeah. ways to look at that. Is San Jose could beat Anaheim, or you could have Anaheim go all the way to the end, and we say, you know what, we got beat by the best. Yeah. Either way, I don't care. Like, I think the East is gonna win regardless, and honestly, I don't see anybody touching Pittsburgh. Uh, we'll I see. think they're just too complete of a team. So, Well, Matt, let's sign off here. It's been a long show, and we'll talk to you in about a month when we get ready for the draft. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for a good season, and hopefully next year we have more than four games to talk about in the playoffs. So, But we'll see, and as always, go Flames, go. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.